What is going on everyone? So in this week's video, I wanna share my experience of transitioning from a full-time day job to a career in landscape photography. I had a technique that worked pretty well. It was a long-term approach, although there were some pitfalls along the way, but hopefully this might be of interest to some of you guys who might be on a slimmer path. Uh, but to do that, let's take you all the way back to 2004. So that is when I graduated from San Diego State University and I had a degree in graphic design. Uh, now, I was very interested in photography at the time, but in 2004 to earn a income as a landscape photographer would have been very, very difficult because that was before YouTube, that was before social media. And if one was to earn an income as a landscape photographer, you're probably not gonna be doing a lot of shooting you're probably gonna be leading workshops. And that was something I was just not really all that interested in doing. Uh, immediately after graduating college, I was hired by Nelson Photo Supplies here in San Diego, a family owned camera store since 1950. And uh, it was a really great place to work at the time. A lot of people were uh, dumping film equipment to move to digital. And that's when I got my first experience with large format and got to handle all sorts of cameras and stuff along those lines. Uh, but I worked at Nelson Photo from 2004 all the way up until the start of the pandemic in 2020. Um, and it was around 2008, 2009 when there was the great recession that happened. And during that time frame, not a lot of people had discretionary income to spend on camera gear. So the camera store was very, very quiet. So I volunteered to take some time off, uh, unpaid, and then go on some solo landscape photography trips. And that's when I really fell in love with the process of going on these trips in the field. And uh, I had a written blog at the time and I started doing a little bit of video as well. And it was in 2009 that I posted the first uh, of my videos on YouTube. It was not a great video, but it was, uh, it was a first nonetheless. And it was a, a hike to Subway in Zion National Park. And so not long after that, I posted some more stuff on YouTube. And now there were a few videos that gathered a lot of attention and they didn't make a little bit of ad revenue. Um, but honestly, whenever a video goes viral, it's not a great experience. I, I, it was a very negative experience to be perfectly honest because the sort of people it attracted, the sort of comments that it attracted um, was incredibly negative. And so it left a really bad taste in my mouth after that. And it was not long after that that I realized that uh, on YouTube, um, if you are going to do pretty well with that, um, that's the sort of crowd that you're probably going to be attracting to your videos in order to make money off of it. And so it was at that point I decided to do user supported content. And then eventually I just shut off the ads altogether. Um, so I learned pretty early on user supported content was the direction that I felt more comfortable going because it allowed me to be more genuine with the content um, and not have to worry about uh, the ads and everything else that goes along with it. Now, I made a, uh, a little chart here, which I'll put up here in the video. Now this shows my, uh, the entire height of the bar shows my complete income that year. The shaded portion comes from my day job and then the non-shaded portion comes from photography. So this starts in 2012. So 2012 and 2013, uh, that tiny little bit of photography income, uh, that was from the voluntary contributions. And you can see how it was a nice little supplement to what I was making at the camera store, but it was nowhere near enough in order to pursue this as a career. You'll see that 2014, 2015, and 2016, uh, they all look fairly similar in terms of the ratio between the camera store income as well as the photography income. And those years have a little bit more income from the previous two years because that is when I started selling a, a portfolio book at the end of the year. It started as just a gift I'd give to family and friends around Christmas time. But in 2013, end of the year rolled around, I was pretty happy with it. So I sold, a, I think it's like an addition of 20 of those. And that became a thing in 2014, 2015, and 2016. Now you'll see in 2017, the photography income increased a bit, but also my day job income decreased a little bit. So that was a year that I made two changes. So I, that was the first year I started doing the portfolio box sets. And that's because the company that made the books, they went out of business. And so I figured, hey, I can do this on my own. I can use nicer materials, it'll be archival. And so 2017 onward, uh, I started doing the portfolio box sets, which was 
one of the things instrumental in me being able to pursue photography as a career. Now the day job income drops that year because that was also the year I decided to start shaving off hours of the work week um, at my day job. So instead of working five days a week, I would only work four days a week. And if you follow that trend uh, from 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, each year my plan was to scale off one day of the work week and this would uh, smooth the transition a little bit. That way I would have the ability to free up a little bit more time to work in photography. At the same time, uh, you know, scaling off the day job a little bit, which put a little pressure on me to work a little bit harder from a photography standpoint. So this technique actually worked pretty well. And it's mostly because the employer I had, Nelson Photo, um, Nancy and Larry, the owners there, they were really good about that. They encouraged people to you know, pursue their own photography and many people that work there work part-time. So if you do have a job that gives you the ability and the flexibility to perhaps scale back your hours a little bit by a little bit, it is a way of smoothing that transition. Though I will say that every time I you know, rip off that last page of the calendar each year, I know that January would come around. Now to have my self-imposed, hey, I'm going down, you know, you know, my day job income is gonna drop a little bit more. That would create a little bit of anxiety, um, but also that is what's I think responsible for allowing me to um, get, make me work a bit harder is kind of what it comes down to. So if you look at the trend there, 2017, 2018, 2019, on those years, the photography income stayed fairly constant um, while dropping the day job income. Now 2020, this was the year when I was supposed to be working just one day a week. So it's gonna be my final year of working at the camera shop, but then the pandemic happened. And when the pandemic happened, it was March. At that point, I figured, you know, I already have the tools I pretty much need in order to pursue landscape photography as a career. By that point I had the box sets I was working on and then the contributions, which was mostly enough in order to replace the income that I already had. Now I'm gonna show you another um, chart here, which is a pie chart. Now this pie chart is uh, representative of my photography income from 2020. So it's broken down into percentages. So 43% uh, comes from the portfolio box set. So it's a very sizable chunk. Voluntary contributions, 24%, prints, 22%, eBooks, 7%, affiliate links, which are the links for B&H and Amazon in the show notes below, that's 3%, and then YouTube, which is 1%, because I still have some older videos on YouTube that exist just to make sure YouTube doesn't completely hate me for not running ads on these videos. But if you look at the way that I have this broken down, the portfolio box sets, they're a lot of work to produce. It's a lot of pressure on my shoulders because by the end of the year, I need to have 10 images that I'm very, very confident in. And it pushes me to produce the level of work that I'm gonna be satisfied with. Um, the voluntary contributions, the eBooks, the affiliates, and the YouTube, uh, all of those fall in the category of passive income. So this is income that helps to weather the storm a little bit, I guess you'd say, helps to take a little bit of pressure off me when it comes to the portfolio box sets. Because if everything was running on the lines in one single category, it creates a lot of pressure. And so uh, by building up the passive income, it does allow me to um, have a little, basically I'm a little less of a stress case before going on a landscape photography trip. It's still, still a bit of a stress case. Uh, prints are always just a nice little bonus. It's not something that I depend on. It's not something I factor in, but when the orders come in, I'm extremely grateful for it. It's kind of like that little cherry on the top. Um, so I think by having that balance between passive income along with a sort of income that encourages me to go out and to work hard and to gather new work, um, that has been a very good balance for me so far. Um, now, one thing I'll say is that when I first started doing this, um, you know, YouTube didn't exist, social media didn't exist. There was no path really to earn an income with landscape photography. Um, and I made a promise to myself a long time ago that if I ever do choose to pursue photography as a career, I never want it to become work. I never want it to be the sort of thing where I look at my camera and say, oh no, I don't wanna do this right now. I always want it to keep it enjoyable because for me, that's what photography has always been. And when I graduated from college, the path to where I am right now, it didn't really exist. I like to equate it a little bit to 
perhaps you know sailing over a horizon. You don't see your destination, uh, but you know that if you stay on course, if you work hard, if you put your heart and soul into it, and if you stay true to yourself, you'll eventually get there. It might take a long time, but for me, that was very important. I'm the type of person that likes to ease into something a little bit at a time. And even though every single year when my income would take a pretty big hit, um, it would give me a minor panic attack at the start of each year. And that was, it served as motivation to, to get me to where I really need to be. And also if I look back at the various trips I've gone on through the years, all the trips leading up until about 2016, going on the trip in the field always felt like a little bit of an escape from everyday life. Once I was depending on photography more for an income, it does change the dynamics of things a bit. I don't see it as work. I'm very happy that I've been able to keep that, um, keep that promise to myself. Um, but you do have more pressure on your shoulders to produce a certain level of work. And um, I do think though that that feeling will probably fade a little bit because at a certain point you have to learn to trust yourself and to go with your instinct because that has kind of guided you to the point where you are. So if any of you guys are on the similar path, you think about maybe a career in photography, just know that just like when I set out on this back in 2004, there wasn't a there wasn't a path at that point in time. But you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, things will be completely different than they are right now. So stay true to yourself, work hard, put your heart and soul into it, and eventually perhaps that pathway will exist even if you don't see it right now. But I wanna thank everyone for watching, and we'll see you around next time. All right, I have my camera set up here at Zion. Uh, this is a subway, and you can pretty much get a feeling for where I'm shooting here. I already shot two sheets of film, one of Provia 100, as a good reciprocity failure characteristics, and then I shot another one.